I'm Mahava Lupteg. Welcome back to What Did You Learn? I am very excited to have here with me today my good friend, Carla Bryant. Carla is the EVP of Corrigan Consulting. Carla, welcome so much. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Ahava. I'm delighted to be here with you this afternoon. Yeah, it's fun. It's a Monday. It's so fun. We're really looking forward to it. How have you spent time during the pandemic? Like, do you have any hobbies? Have you taken? Um, well, I've been doing more knitting than I was before. Oh. So now I'm just buying yarn. I'm actually knitting some of it, although we're still buying more than we're actually knitting. But um, we're we're moving in that direction slowly but surely. Um, I mastered the art of sourdough bread. Good for you. Um, I tried that um, several times. It had false starts. And I think because of our travel schedules, if you're not there to really feed it on a regular basis, um, at correct. least in the beginning, and you know, as you develop it and you gain confidence in it, you know what you can let sit in the refrigerator for a couple of weeks and not worry about. Um, but yeah, I've definitely enjoyed that. So we eat a lot of bread and I bake just in general. I bake a lot, which is not a good thing. <laughs> it sounds delicious. <laughs> Just means when you know you get ready to go back on the road, we might have to rethink wardrobe a little bit. But um, I know somebody just said to me the other day, she's like, I forgot what it's like to wear pants without elastic. I know. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? She's like, my button popped off when I went to go sit down. I was like, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Oh, Carla, how long have you been in healthcare marketing? In I have been in healthcare marketing since about 2004. Two, 2001, 2002, but I've been in healthcare since 1982. So I have seen a lot. I know I'm old. I have seen a lot of changes. Because when I first started in healthcare, there was no such thing as marketing. Oh, really? What was it, it called? It did not exist. There was a public relations person. I was with a large health system, now part of Texas Health Resources. We had one per, uh, person in public relations and one in community relations. But in 1982, that was before prospective payment and DRGs came to play. So hospitals were sitting fat and happy. And then all of a sudden, literally overnight in 1983, hospitals went from full to some of them at half of what their normal ADC was. So it was a huge change um, in how we were paid, a huge change in just market dynamics. It was an interesting time. So I actually don't know anything about what you're talking about. So can yep. you give me a little bit of a history lesson? I would love it. Sure. Well, um, back in, um, of course, there goes my cats. Sorry. If you hear <laughs> strange noises in the background, yes, we're crazy cat people here. But um, in, um, we had before prospective payment or DRGs came to pass, hospitals were basically reimbursed on a charge basis. So we, our pockets were full, hospitals were full, um, and it was a, a happy time for everybody. Then um, the government changed Medicare to be paid on these fixed rate DRG segments. So that meant that instead of being like we had a small rural hospital, that a lot of people stayed because Betty's husband wasn't really prepared to um, help, help her at home. So she's going to stay in the hospital for a few nights extra, just until we know she's back on her feet and get to the kitchen and cook dinner and things like that. And all of that stopped when now you're being a, paid a flat fee for somebody's stay. And so it changed things dramatically. And I can remember um, we were the, um, the largest system in Tarrant County, which is where Fort Worth is located. And we had the largest OB program in the state, or not in the state, but in the county, I should say. I think 70 plus percent of all the babies were born at a Harris hospital. So definitely had the lion's share of them. And so I remember the first advertising that was ever done, like in 19... 80, it's probably 1985. And it was a full page black and white ad in the paper of the um, guy holding the baby on his chest, daddy's girl. And so here we were, it was a great ad um, talking to people, but we were going to get that business regardless, right? So, right. <laughs> uh, so we, we were making ourselves feel good, not necessarily making um, any sense from a marketing perspective. So I was in strategic planning at the time. 
But um, I, I think so what happened is marketing evolved from what I call the soft side of healthcare. So it evolved out of those PR people that were sitting in the offices already and community relations, which were much more event and community education related. And so then the advertising layer got put on top of that. And so I think that's um, kind of why we've seen this, again, the softer side of marketing, more of the advertising and promotion and communication side of marketing versus the street strategic data driven, how do we grow our business um, piece of marketing. Let's think about it. If I'm an executive going through my NHA programs in the mid to late 80s, I'm not being taught anything about marketing. Right. And that persisted into the 90s. And even then you were getting just a little taste of marketing um, defined by the way we had started to define it in healthcare. So it's been a really interesting journey to watch from a variety of different angles. But yeah, it's I've been That's, it for a long time. That is so helpful. I never really knew that. Here's what I get really stuck on and I cannot figure this out. The data driven academic medical center any doctor forget it even if they're in a community hospital with you know 90 beds they learn to be a doctor the people around them trust science they understand data they understand business you put this in front of them you say to them this works this is how to do it and they're like we don't care and i don't understand because in order to be a great doctor you have to have some curiosity about the world and in order to be a great marketer you have to have some curiosity about the world what are we doing wrong and i, and I think they do have that curiosity but i think we have to understand the psyche that we're dealing with one is while doctors are very science driven um, they are curious i think by nature in their respective professions or the things that interest them. One is from a marketing perspective, all they've known is the advertising side of the world. And they what they see is what they know. And just like I haven't spent that much time thinking about um, sailboats, um, they haven't spent that much time, which is an area of interest for doctors in my part of the world. Um, I, they haven't spent much time necessarily thinking about marketing. But also one of the things that I learned when I was in um, IT, we developed one of the um, first um, physician portals in the nation. So this was where physicians could go to get all of their medical record documents. They could read them, they could edit them, they could sign them. Um, and then we added other functionality there as well. But what I learned, and it was an aha for me, is physicians learn um, part of being successful is the things that are the day-to-day -day are the things that never change. So a doctor will dictate an HMP on his first day of practice in the exact same way a doctor will dictate their HMP on their last day of practice. And they're used to looking at those documents that are coming to them from a variety of different standpoint and have that trust and confidence that no matter who sends me an HMP to look at as part of a referral or what hospital I'm in, they're all gonna look the same. So I know where to look for key pieces of information. Just like a radiology report, I wanna know from a technology standpoint, I wanted to be able to take the last paragraph and make it the first paragraph because the last paragraph says, here's, you know, here's in the summary, this is yeah. what we found, right? right? The other paragraphs are the, you know, more descriptive detail about it. And so I wanted to turn it around for those doctors who just wanted to be able to see the outcome. All was, you know, no, no further imaging required or whatever. Um, but yet that was hard for them to wrap their arms around because it just wasn't the way it had been done. So I think there are some things, think about it in the operating room. You know, the team that performs exceptionally well is the team that knows how to anticipate that doctor's needs. And so it is about having, there is comfort in the routine. And so from a marketing standpoint, what they've always seen has been the softer side. It has been billboards, which, you know, people in healthcare made a huge investment in outdoor boards, which I never have understood because they're about gas next exit, food next exit, or in my day, it was Stuckey's next exit. Or um, political campaigns. Yeah, or things, but they, they had a purpose of helping you find something. Yeah. People aren't driving down the highway and seeing a doctor on a billboard and think, hey, I should call them and see about my knee. <laughs> it just, it, we're using a, 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 a channel for a way it was never intended. Yeah. 
has garnered an awful lot of attention. And as a result, we have a lot of, a lot of organizations have a lot of outdoor boards that probably aren't doing anything to move the needle from a marketing perspective, certainly not from a revenue perspective. And I don't think they're even moving the needle from an awareness perspective. Do you think that the meta messages of the pandemic, inclusivity, building brand awareness through trust, being open, being transparent, do you think that those are going to continue when the pandemic is over? I, I think that's a great question, and I don't know the answer to that. I think that, um, you know, early on, as you know, there was a lot of more tactical information that was being communicated. Um, and I think, uh, and the data even showed that there was increased trust in the health system and increased support for it. I think that as people's patience with the pandemic has waned, it's gone on a long time, and hospitals and health systems are still conveying those messages. I think their patience with the, their, this, um, this adoration that they had and admiration for the health systems that came on early has also waned a little bit because they're getting frustrated by the protocols and the adherence to protocols. And it's not just healthcare, but if they do intervene with the system, there's that sense. We still see a strong hesitancy of people using healthcare, um, especially in those elective um, procedures. And so I, um, I think the brand building is, is good. I don't know what kind of returns we will see for, from it in the near term, in part because everybody has been invested in doing that same level of trying to build brand trust. So I don't know that what we're doing is distinctive in the market to drive preference. Um, what do you think, if you're thinking about the next 18 months for your clients, you know, you do a lot of strategy, right? What do you think the major challenge is going to be besides for recouping revenue and getting people back through the doors? That's the obvious one. A couple of things, and I think you've mentioned it before, is this 12, 14 month period that we've just seen, um, there had, there has been a heavy shift back to communications in marketing. So there's been very little strategic marketing planning, um, very little talk or thought about how do we recoup revenue other than how do we get ORs back open, how do we get back up to capacity, those types of things. And so I think now part of that is um, starting to steer that ship back in the strategy direction. And I, I worry about that a little bit. I think there's been some the positives and negatives out of that. I think it's been positive in that I think leadership has recognized the important role of the marketing and communications team and where they may have been excluded in some conversations before, realize the importance of making sure that they know everything we're doing as it relates to COVID and are you know, helping us support that on the front lines internally and externally. So I think marketing and communications has gotten an awful lot of credit in that regard. But one of the things that we struggle with and a lot of our clients struggle with is getting out of the communications bucket or the mark um, bucket and into the strategic marketing bucket. And I think COVID has almost made that, um, I worry whether or not COVID has made that more difficult. If I, if I trust my marketing and comm team more after getting to know them better, maybe it'll be easier to steer in the strategy direction. But what we've done is we've spent 12 months focusing on marketing and communications and not on real data-driven strategy. Data -driven strategy right. right. Now, okay, so let me ask you a question. So we've broken down certain silos, right? Because we kind of said to people who are typically doing marketing and strategy, hey, we need you over here in communication. Oh, absolutely. Come see the softer side of what we do. Can we capitalize on some of that silo and not go with human behavior, but go against our behavior to go back to that silo and say, look, now let us take you back to strategy and let's also make our communications more strategic. Well, and I think that goes to thinking about, you know, kind of the redesign of marketing, which we worked on a lot pre-COVID. Pre um, and now we're starting to see some interest pick back up on that. I think because um, we have broken the silos down, um, and so how do we need to structure moving forward, knowing that technology has radically changed the discipline of marketing, knowing that consumer behaviors, beliefs, preferences 
um, already were changing and those have been accelerated with the pandemic and we still don't know exactly where they'll land. Like you said, we have a tendency to go back, but we don't necessarily go back 100% to the way we were. Certain things um, change permanently, some things don't. And then we've just got, we're gonna have this um, increased demand to drive revenue um, because so many have been so hard hit. So I think there is some, people are starting to think about how do I take the best of what happened with everybody kind of all hands on deck working together and how do I institutionalize that, so to speak, by putting a structure in place that facilitates that moving forward. You know, one of the things I talked with a lot of teams about is, you know, the, the best attributes I think of a healthcare marketer today, or they have to have the aptitude for the job that they're hired to do. So I've got to have the technical skill. I've got to have the right attitude, which is part of the key to breaking down those silos, right? Is that while I have the skills, it doesn't mean I am the only expert in those areas or the only person who can get some of these things done. And so I embrace that wider group effort to move things forward. And then that agility, which we have seen in spades, but can we operate with that level of agility? Again, how do we create the structure so that we don't only do that in crisis, but we do that as routine? And maybe that's putting together, you know, these kind of strike teams that come together on a particular project, much like we came together on COVID communication. Everybody comes in, we get the job done, we go back, we come in over here and build another project team. Um, so how, what that's going to look like, I'm not really sure, but I think we are going to see that that focus on how do we how do we take what we did so well and make it so we can make it happen over and over and over right. again. I love that. So aptitude, attitude, agility. Yep. And Carla, this has been an unbelievable, what did you learn? I learned everything I had to know about healthcare marketing. It's been I thought you learned everything you need to know about healthcare marketing, but it's been a fun discussion. So it's an interesting field. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody who's thinking about going into it should watch this interview before they do. But Carla, where can people find you? I am at um, Carla at CorriganConsulting.com. Okay. And then um, you can find, you can call or text at 757-477-1575. Wow, a phone number. People are phone lucky. number, wild, huh? So, um, and I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Anyway, it was really wonderful having you. Thank you so much. It was great talking with you, Ahava. Thank you so much.